quite um, quite extensive uh, bio, actually. So thank you all for being here. It's really a pleasure to be in London in that uh, really warm and sunny and beautiful weather. I'm <laughs> really thankful to the organizing committee to have uh, invited me here. I'm really honored. And I'm going to speak uh, to you about the ear beyond hearing. So what can we do more than just the sense of hearing that we all share? And uh, I will start with a little question. Can you all hear me well? Well, that's good for you, because you know currently, this is Monday, and there have been uh, 100 millions of workers that have been taking their job positions, and that are currently exposing their ears to loud levels of noise that are dangerous for their hearing, and who are actually at risk of losing their hearing. So this is several hundred millions of people nowadays. And if you look at this uh, website from the World Health uh, Organization, the WHO, and you will see that they estimate that the risk of noise-induced hearing loss is actually reaching 1.2 billion people. Why? 1.2 billion people, that's a lot of people. Because it's actually uh, a risk that a young, popu young population of younger uh, adults are now being exposed to because of this uh, um, ubiquity of music players, cell phones, uh, wearable devices, and so on and so forth. So I think this conversation will go uh, around the hearing, the sense of hearing, how to protect it, how to enhance it, and what can we do in the ear canal, and you'll see those uh, applications that we'll uh, call wearable technology for the ear. But before that, I'd like to share a very nice little moment with you, uh, inspecting, as engineers could do, what the ear is actually uh, doing and how it's functioning. So for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the work uh, from uh, Brendan Pletch, He's an American uh, specialist in video editing for scientific publications. And this five minutes video that I will show you integrally is about the auditory transduction. And you will see, you will discover the ear under a very nice angle. So let's appreciate that. The sense of hearing is accomplished by a process known as auditory transduction. The ear converts sound waves in the air into electrical impulses, which can be interpreted by the brain. As sound enters the ear, it passes through the external auditory canal, where it meets the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane then vibrates in response to the sound. Sounds of a lower pitch, or frequency, produce a slower rate of vibration. And sounds of lower volume, or amplitude, produce a less dramatic vibration. Higher frequency sounds produce faster vibrations. The tympanic membrane is cone-shaped and articulates with a chain of three bones called the auditory ossicles. They consist of the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The movements of the tympanic membrane vibrate the ossicles, passing on the information of frequency and amplitude. The three bones pivot together on an axis shown here in red. The pivotal axis is due to a series of ligaments which hold the bones in place within the middle ear cavity. The anterior malleal ligament and the posterior incutal ligament are of particular importance for the pivotal axis. Two structures which normally obscure this view of the middle ear have been removed. They are the chordae tympani nerve and the tendon of the tensor tympani muscle. Through the ossicles, the vibrations of the tympanic membrane are transferred to the footplate of the stapes.
The stapes moves with a piston-like action, which sends vibrations into a structure called the bony labyrinth. The labyrinth is filled with a fluid called paralymph. If it were a completely closed and inflexible system, the movement of the stapes would be unable to displace the paralymph, and therefore unable to send vibrations into the bony structure. Due to the flexibility of a membrane called the round window, the stapes movement can displace the paralymph, allowing vibrations to enter the labyrinth. The corridor leading to the round window is found within the spiral portion of the bony labyrinth known as the cochlea. Vibrations produced by the stapes are drawn into the spiral system and return to meet the round window. The portion of the spiral passage in which vibrations ascend to the apex of the cochlea is called the scala vestibuli. The descending portion of the passage is called the scala tympani. A third structure, called the cochlear duct, is situated between the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. The cochlear duct is filled with a fluid called endolymph, and when viewed in cross-section, the membranes separating the two fluid-filled systems are visible. They are Reissner's membrane and the basilar membrane. The membranes are flexible and move in response to the vibrations traveling up the scale of vestibuli. The movements of the membranes then send vibrations back down to the scale of tympani. A specialized structure called the organ of corti is situated on the basilar membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the organ of corti is stimulated which sends nerve impulses to the brain via the cochlear nerve. The actual nerve impulses are generated by specialized cells within the organ of corti called hair cells. The hair cells are closely covered by a structure called the tectorial membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the tiny clusters of hairs are bent against the tectorial membrane, triggering the hair cells to fire. The entire basilar membrane does not vibrate simultaneously. Instead, specific areas along the basilar membrane move variably in response to different frequencies of sound. Lower frequencies vibrate the basilar membrane closer to the apex of the cochlea, whereas higher frequencies produce vibrations closer to the base. This arrangement is known as tonotopic organization. Together, this sequence of events is responsible for our acoustic perception of the world around us. So I think this is really a great video that is really self-explanatory and very well in terms of uh, didactic uh, aspects. And obviously, once we are aware of how complex and how fine this you know, machine is, the first thing you want to do is to really protect that ear. So this is actually the first domain we're going to explore in a few minutes. That's hearing protection. How do we protect from toxic noise and prevent noise-induced hearing loss? But then, obviously, if you have hearing protection, you need to be able to communicate as well in noise. And so that's the area we're going to see in green, how we can communicate and wear communication earpieces and the type of research we are doing in this area. And the last domain is obviously that, unfortunately, if you happen to have some kind of hearing loss, be it occupational or recreational, well, there is not much you can do but wear some amplifiers, some hearing aid, as we call them. And we're going to address or look at them uh, finally. 
So now what I'd like to uh, show you is a little bit of the research we are doing in our group and uh, research that is being done in other uh, institutes as well as to merge those three cycles, the blue, the green, and the red together in a so-called hearable device. So hearable, that's really you know, the kind of wearable device. You know wearable, you have maybe a smart watch or smart glasses, you know those devices you wear that connects you to some kind of uh, biometric uh, data or apps. Here, the idea of a hearing ball is that you're wearing this device, and the device actually collects information and enables those protection, amplification, and communication features. So I cannot share what the others are doing, but I will share what we do in our lab, and I will show you a little bit of what we call the auditory research platform. So this is really a hardware that we designed over the years. And it looks like this. So this is really components from the hearing aid industry. Here, that's the, micro the uh, speaker that we plug. Here, the little internal microphone. And we would put that microphone and that speaker into some uh, acoustic component, component. And we would put an external microphone that will pick up the ambient uh, noise or sounds and some electronic and uh, interconnection between outer microphone and in-ear microphones. And we'll use the space that you have behind the ear uh, in that banana shape uh, casing in which we will put the electronic that we need. So we need battery, digital signal processor, and we can connect that or have it worked uh, wired or wireless. Depends on the kind of application. And finally, we will uh, use an earpiece, so something that goes and makes an acoustic seal inside the ear canal. So it can be a foam tip, or it can be what we call a custom molded uh, earplug. I'll mention that in a minute. So this is typically the kind of device that we are dealing with as we are you know, engineers and uh, implementing new algorithms and developing new uh, research on this uh, hardware. So now let's look back at uh, the three domains of interest for today's talk. So the first one is really hearing protection. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with some uh, types of hearing protectors, and certainly with what we call the passive hearing protectors. So you recognize on the left side what we call the foam plug, then um, a pre-molded ear plug, then those custom molded ear plugs. They are made with some ear impressions inside your ear canal, and maybe just some ear cups or ear muffs on the far right. So what you may not know is that those uh, hearing protectors really suffer from major uh, problems, and there are really three issues that can be summarized in two big groups. The first one being the lack of comfort. You probably know that those products are not necessarily very comfortable. From a physical point of view, you have a lot of workers that won't fit them because they hurt. They are painful. They don't appreciate the comfort or the contact of those products. But they lack as well comfort in terms of uh, sound transmission, in the sense that when you're wearing that device inside the ear, you don't hear the warning sounds. You don't hear the speech that well. So you really have a comfort issue with, in terms of uh, audibility of signals. The second uh, big domain is that we don't know absolutely, we have absolutely no idea if I give you an earplug of, to each of you, I have no clue if this earplug is effective or not. I don't know its attenuation. I have strictly no idea if I'm doing a job properly and protecting your hearing. So let's look at the first uh, issue, the lack of comfort, and how that has been addressed, for example, uh, within the, our, um, our community. Uh, first, by understanding that when you don't wear a hearing protector, you are really quickly losing its, its effectiveness. So what you have here is on the X axis, that's the time you're not wearing the protector. And on the Y axis, this is the attenuation you get. So what you can see, if I'm taking the blue hearing protector, it gives you a 30 dB nominal attenuation. But if I forget to put it for 30 minutes on an eight hour shift, I'm lo losing the attenuation already by and I will just move my mouse so that you see it. 30 minutes, I'm there. So from the blue curve, I'm no longer at 30 dB, but at 12 dB. So this is how much the overall attenuation has been reduced because I removed that earplug for half an hour during my work shift. So we realize the problem that if people remove their hearing protectors to communicate, to take a call, and so on, they lose the protection from uh, the ambient noise. Second problem you have with this graph is that the blue curve with a really high uh, attenuation product, but if I'm taking a less uh, performant earplug, 10 dB, the green line, you see that after half an hour of not wearing that earplug, I lose just even not 1 dB. So the consequence is less dramatic for bad earplugs, but for good earplugs, if you want them to be effective, you have to wear them continuously. So this is a little bit of a paradox. You know, the better the earplug, the more you should wear it, or the better you should wear it. 
So that to get its nominal attenuation. So this is really the reason you want something to be comfortable in your ear. So what has been done over the years, and that was uh, when I was in industry working with that company, and we developed custom earplugs that were uh, dispensed on the spot to the workers in industry. And you know that custom earplugs can be made by uh, audiologists or audioprothesists and so on. You go to a clinic and you get your ear impression done. But here what was developed uh, and um, won several awards over the recent years, like the CS Innovation Award, and just got this year um, the Darwin Award, is this process where we'll be inflating an earplug inside your ear canal. So just to give you an idea of how we custom mold those products, this is a little video that shows you that we'll have a silicone mixture that will be inside that little pump. And the pump will be activated and will flow that black silicone inside an, a membrane, an envelope. And that earplug is an inflatable uh, earplug. And it will be custom molded to the unique shape of your ear canal. And after three minutes, you can remove it. And you have the solid uh, earpiece that corresponds to the exact shape of your ear canal. And that can be your hearing protectors or then can become the smart platform we are working with uh, I, uh, that I mentioned earlier. So that's the kind of technology going into the custom molded uh, business is really what will happen. You are all familiar with the 3D printing. You know that we can scan now the ear canal uh, that becomes easier and easier. So there will be one day where we'll just have a home scanner, you know, and you'll just print your own ear canal uh, directly from your 3D printing at home. That will be just, you know, 10 years from now, that would be, I guess, quite usual. So let's go back to the uh, problem of the unknown attenuation. And obviously, uh, if you don't know what at kind of attenuation you're getting from your earplug, you should uh, measure it. And the idea of measuring it, oh, sorry, I should mention that since the attenuation was really unknown, and I'm showing you here some data that was uh, collected for a book chapter that we updated recently. And this is the summary of uh, studies, uh, more than 40 studies that includes European data, North American data. And this is uh, for five types of products. Uh, and here on the left, this is really for a foam plug. So the roll down foam plug, the yellow plug, let's say. Typically, in lab, give you the 30 dB we mentioned. And in the field, what you get is really that real world attenuation. So the noise reduction rating would be less than 5 dB. So really, if I give you all that yellow foam plug with no training, and I ask you to get uh, and I measure the attenuation, I will get an average uh, in, in, at the uh, 90, 98th percentile uh, value of uh, 5 dB or less for the uh, group attenuation. So that's really the problem is that there's a huge discrepancy between the theoretical value and the practical value. So to address that, the idea is really to measure on every individual what the attenuation of the earplug or device is. And again, this is something that we've done over the years. And here, what I'm showing you is just the custom earplug where you see a sound bore, so this is a tube that goes through the earplug. And you see that we have a dual element microphone. So you can see two microphones. Can you see the green one inside and the green one outside? And they will pick up the sound pressure level uh, outside and inside the earplug to give you an estimation of the attenuation of the device. And that's something that uh, was released in the early uh, 2000. And that actually gave, a lot of, um, gave birth of a lot of applications. And the first one is really uh, that this system was actually bought out by the company, which is a 3M, so it's an American company that you may know. And they adapted it for their product. Their products are non-custom products. And you see here some uh, combat arm earplugs that, are, um, that have a probe tube, and you can measure the attenuation. So again, to measure the attenuation, you have a loud, loud source of noise. So this is a sound source that you can see on the lower left. And you have that earplug that the user will fit so he the worker will fit it the way he would normally do. And you measure with the microphone the outside noise, inside noise, and you get the personal attenuation rating. So that's a big, big, big thing in the occupational health and safety community. Really changed over the last 10 years uh, the practice and how we uh, administer the hearing conservation programs uh, in North America spe specifically. And so that's no, no surprise that a lot of um, competitors or manufacturers are now uh, offering those kind of fit testing systems. And here you can see one that has been developed um, as well in the United States, which is using a different uh, testing paradigm. And here, basically, you're testing hearing. You're testing hearing of the, the hearing threshold of the subject with and without the earplug. So if I'm giving you the graph on the right, you see the open ear on the uh, upper section. 
And then I ask you to put the earplug in, and you will hear with a different level. Your hearing threshold has uh, shifted. And I will know what kind of attenuation you're getting from the earplug. So this is called the real ear attenuation and threshold testing, and this is a, another fit test approach. Last one that I wanted to uh, show you is one that has been commercialized, I think, as well in Europe, and uh, that uses what we call loudness balance. So loudness balance is basically that I ask you to balance left and right two sounds that will be sent uh, to your ear canals with the earplug uh, in place or not. So that will be open versus closed, and then closed versus closed, and then closed versus open. So there is a, a lot of uh, calculation and adjustment behind, but the idea is that I can fit test anybody on the spot wearing uh, those kind of uh, hearing protection devices. So I just shown you three of them. Uh, there is an exhaust exhaustive uh, listing with uh, some European products as well uh, that we included in the latest version of uh, that manual that is about to come, which is called the Noise Manual that's published by the American Institute of uh, Industrial Hygiene. And um, that has a specific chapter on what we call fit testing methods. And I'm also proud to say that the Canadian uh, Standard Association, the CSA, actually has in its uh, latest version, which is the 2014, uh, a chapter, chapter 13, which is on the use of fit testing systems for hearing protectors. So I guess that gives you a little bit of a background of what was done and what is now done uh, trendy uh, in passive hearing protection. But you understand that we want to do this active and smart with the electronic and all the components I've shown you before. So if we look at the intersection of the hearing protection and the communication earpiece, this is really that I want my worker to be isolated from the toxic noise, but able to pick up voices and warning signals that, get, that are uh, around. So one of the first applications we developed was what we call voice uh, denoising. So the idea is that you have that custom earpiece that blocks the noise passively. And then when you detect that there is some speech, you transmit the speech. But obviously, you have to denoise that speech and only transmit the useful signal, get rid of the background noise. And this is what we do using some uh, temporal approach uh, that are well, digital uh, multiband uh, noise reduction. And uh, in clear, that's the kind of uh, filtering we get. So you can see on the uh, upper graph the clean voice signal. Middle graph, you see the noise that has been added to that, noise that voice signal at uh, 0 dB uh, signal to noise ratio. And lower graph, that's the denoise or enhanced uh, speech signal. And it's interesting because that's, um, obviously it's easy to denoise a signal, but what's hard is to keep the intelligibility of the signal, make it clear and make it sound intelligible. And this is what we uh, were able to, ac to achieve using a very limited uh, power consumption on the DSP. So I'm sure you want to hear something. So I will go to the last part of the communication and show you one application that is uh, quite uh, performant for communicating in between people. So let's imagine that now the workers are wearing those devices. We call them auditory research platform. And so it can be a belt pack or it could be in the earpiece as I've shown you. And you have again the outside microphone, inside microphone and loudspeaker. What we will do, we will use the in-ear microphone to pick up the speech and transmit it over radio to the second uh, worker. What I'd like to give you is the little demo of the gain we have by using the in-ear microphone in the presence of a very loud noise. So here's the earplug. You recognize it with the external microphone, internal microphone, and uh, internal speaker in red. And what I will do is play the clean signal picked up by the external microphone if there is no noise. The birch canoe slid on the smooth plank. And then we're going to play it with a 0 dB SNR in noise. Very hard to hear. Let's listen to the in-ear microphone. The birch canoe slid on the smooth plank. There is something, but there is some noise and very boomy. We'll remove the noise. The birch canoe slid on the smooth plank. Still very boomy, so we'll enhance the speech. The birch canoe slid on the smooth plank. And it's not too different uh, from the original signal that we hear again. The birch canoe slid on the smooth plank. There's definitely a EQ difference, but you can see that we have some intelligibility that has been recreated here. The birch canoe slid on the smooth plank. And so that signal can be sent over, over FM radios or over wireless systems to uh, another worker, and they communi can communicate very naturally in those very high uh, noise environments. So this is typically the kind of application that our partner is putting out on, on the market. And they can uh, work, I think, in 105 dB and have a clear conversation with no vocal effort. So it's quite impressive to see in real life as well. 
So now let's go back to the real life and the real life that you may know, uh, may know from your you know, um, journey on the, on the tub here or just uh, underground. You would see a lot of people wearing devices that looks really like uh, earphones, but that could slowly uh, be uh, some wearable technology. So you, you may have seen recently uh, that device out. So it looks like an earphone, but it has no wire. So it's a wireless earphones, right? But the thing that you may or should realize is that for me, when I saw that coming out, and obviously I, I knew it was coming out, but um, that, that, that's a very big step uh, to a new future. And the new future that is that people will be able to wear anything in their ear without being noticed. And that's a joke. Obviously, this is a toothbrush. But this means really that there is no shame now uh, at wearing something in the ear. And you don't know if that something is a toothbrush or if it's a hearing aid or something that is helping you, or is that music, or is that uh, protection. You don't know, because there will be a complete integration of those three features inside one uh, domain, one, fit, one system, one device. I'm not the only one to foresee, obviously, that, uh, that thing. And there is actually a fellow out of London, uh, Nick Hoon is his name, and he has this report out, uh, which is the market of hearable devices for the 2016-2020. Uh, and what he says as well is that this uh, is really accelerating the acceptance of those in-ear devices. And there won't be any stigma uh, when people will be wearing something in their ear. They won't look like they are retarded or anything. That will look like just they can be very cool and very trendy. This is just something in their ear. And that's really a new uh, business that is uh, about to, uh, to start and kick. Speaking of kicking, here are some Kickstarters and uh, community-funded uh, projects that went uh, either over Kickstarter or Indiegogo. And you can see that a lot of companies have been in that field. And if there are time for questions, I'm sure you will uh, ping me on those. There are many, many companies that try to have some products that are sport product where you can listen to your music, entertain, uh, have some biometrics, and so on. And this is definitely a trend that is there to, to stay. So the last part um, that I'd like to touch upon is something which is also very, very uh, topical, and that's the hearing aid. And the hearing aid, as you, as you know it, uh, like the device here on top, is actually dead. And I'm studying this today because I know uh, that by the end of the month, so in a couple of days, the Congress, the United States Congress, will pass a new bill, which is called the Over the Counter Hearing Aid Act. And that's the first time, by the way, that Republicans and Democrats are able to agree on something. And they are agreeing on the fact that um, they should allow consumer companies and tech companies to build up hearing aid applications inside their apps and uh, hearing aid device and wearable and hearable technologies. So again, that's something which is really moving forward because all the table of applications I've shown you, all those companies will have now the ability to give you some kind of amplification, hearing aid assistance, personal sound amplification systems, and so on. And so that will be, again, something that will become mainstream. I can see that coming very, very fast as well. So I think that's the first time you hear it from, from, that may be the first time you hear it, but if you have some people, uh, I was last week in Paris discussing with some uh, audio prothesists, and they didn't know about that coming up, but they, they realized that this is really their end, the, the end of their job, because you know that from an app, you cannot tune exactly the kind of response you want. You can tune exactly to your hearing. There is a lot of self-adjustment, not to mention the deep, you know, deep data and deep, uh, deep learning that you can do from all those mass data. So I think things, you know, times are changing. So I think we uh, concluded for the three uh, aspects I wanted to mention that are really the auditory aspects. And now I'd like to go a little bit behind hearing, because that's my promise. Let's go beyond hearing. So I'd like to share with you three other areas that I find interesting. And uh, so two are actually from our labs, and there are other stuff that I find interesting from other labs too. So the first thing is the in-ear biosensing. We can read a lot of biosignals from inside the ear canal. I'll show you how. Many of my colleagues or um, other uh, researchers have been doing very fun stuff inside your ear canal, and I'd like to discuss that and show you what we can do. And finally, I'll show you uh, that we generated a few um, microwatts out of the uh, ear canal, and I'll show you how. So let's go back to the let's go to the in-ear biosensing. So in-ear biosensing, that's really the idea that inside the ear canal you can pick up a lot of information. And here is my quiz. Here, is a bio so here are some bio signals that you can read very easily with what I mentioned, the in-ear microphone. So who can guess what this signal is? You got it right. This is the heartbeat. 
But you know what? That's given for free. If you have an internal microphone, you pick up that noise definitely. You pick, up, you pick it up because you know, the ear canal, when it's occluded, has a, a quite a low frequency response. And you get that signal very clearly, very distinguishable, as you can heard. You, you heard it clear, just filtered. And if you look in the time domain, it correlates very well with any AKG or any electrocardiogram you can do. And what you can see in the uh, spectrogram on the bottom is that you see those marks. Uh, if you pay attention to the very low frequency, again with my mouse, here you can see those black marks. They are really the heartbeats that you heard just a second ago. And what you can see here, those white uh, trenches, they are really the respiration, perspir respiration rate. So I can hear you uh, inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. And that opens a lot of applications. When I have to monitor some people that are doing, working in deep mining industry, in Canada we have deep mines that go really deep. People are really remote, and you want to you know, uh, understand how they are performing and how they are behaving and what their wealth index is. And you can hear that for free with a microphone. You don't need any sensor. You don't need anything complicated. That's just signal processing. I can detect as well if the person is you know, breathing by the nose or if it's including the mouth. So I, mouth, so I have an idea of the kind of force and um, uh, respiratory uh, rate he's uh, into. So this is the kind of information that is, I think, very valuable for a lot of uh, workplaces. Another research we did was uh, to use something which is very well known in the uh, clinical audiological aspect, is the measurement of autoacoustic emissions. So autoacoustic emissions, now that you've seen the video, uh, it's really that if you send two tones, and here I'm sending two frequencies, you can see the five kilohertz in green and the uh, six kilohertz in blue. If I send those two tones at 55 and 65 uh, dB SPR, there will be a very strange phenomena taking place into the cochlea and actually on the outer hair cells that you saw moving. They would amplify those sounds and they would actually create what we call the distortion product. So it's an intermodulation signal. And that distortion product is precisely at the frequency that you see in red, which is 2F1 minus F2. So we know exactly where it will pop up, and we just have to measure it. And by measuring that signal, I now have a proof that your ear canal, your uh, tympanic membrane, the ossicular chain, the cochlea, the outer hair cells are functioning normally. So this is a very useful test that has been used for newborn screening. You may have seen this in a hospital. We can screen newborns and detect before they can respond to an audiogram or talk to you, we can detect if their peripheral system, auditory peripheral system, is functional or not. It does not tell you if they will understand uh, from an upper language um, development system, but at least you know that this is functional on the lower level. So this is very useful. And what we did, we adapted it for the worker in the sense that here, this is one of my PhD students, and he did uh, adapt this for measurement up to 90 dB of work. So I can uh, dB of uh, ambient noise, meaning that I can measure how your ear is getting fatigued over the time. So I don't know if you're fatigued yet by my talk, but if I had that device, I could be measuring you know, how the ear canal, sorry, how the uh, outer hair cells in your uh, cochlea are responding to those stimuli. And I would know exactly if you're being accumulating some noise, dose, and that's really what we can do with this application. The third application that we are doing uh, within our lab is to use EEG recordings. So this is completely non-acoustical signals. Those are really the brain waves, and you know that we can read brain waves uh, you know, on the skull. And this is obviously uh, dates from the uh, 1924 with uh, Professor Berger here uh, doing the first uh, documented uh, audio uh, electrogram, electroencephalogram. And the um, trend nowadays is to have this in clinical setup, as you can see on the left, in hospitals. You can do EEG at very, uh, many, many places. And there are more and more people putting the EEG out of the lab. And you can see that on the right side, people that are developing wearable. And you see on the upper right, somebody wearing a full scalp uh, EEG system with all the electronic in the backpack. And you can see on the lower uh, right that people are now miniaturizing this, having wireless connection, Bluetooth devices that are able to pick up on a few sensors. So it's not as dense as a full scalp uh, EEG, but it gives you some hints, and you can detect mood, you can detect uh, sleepiness, you can detect awareness. There are many applications in biogaming, neurogaming, neurotraining, name it. Uh, every day there is a new application. What was really interesting is that a couple years back, in London, out of the Royal Society, um, one um, fellow named uh, Looney 
had the idea to put electrodes in the ear canal. And that was the first time that it was done. And you can see he put three electrodes, so in the uh, conca, in the ear canal, and uh, one behind the, uh, the uh, pinna, and recorded some signals and got some interesting or promising results. Actually, that was promising, but we realized that there was clearly a problem. And the problem that we saw is that they didn't take in, into account the fact that the ear canal is a very dynamic environment. So believe it or not, but the uh, ear canal is distorting as you speak, as you move your jaw, as you moving your head. And here, what I'm showing you in the little video uh, below is the difference in shape between the open ear canal and the closed ear canal. When you open your mouth, you do have the green response that you see, the green curve. And when you close it, you have the yellow curve. So you can see there is a huge displacement. And you can probably feel it if you dare to put your finger and move your jaws. So that's really something that will destroy all the electrode contact and make a lot of disturbance in your EEG system. And this is why we came up with a personalized uh, placement for those electrodes. And you can see on the left the device that has behind the ear electrodes that has a custom earpiece and that has electrodes that are really carefully placed in places where we will keep the contact whatever happens. So we benchmarked this against a full scalp EEG. Here you can see one of my colleagues out of uh, Oxford. And that's a collaboration we have with Oldenburg in Germany. And we did a uh, benchmark against uh, those clinical systems. And this is the kind of uh, what we call auditory evoked potentials. So for those of you who are familiar, this is really responses from the brain because you send some noise. And here, the noise that we send, those are what we call the auditory oddball. So we send some no noise that are pings or tones that are the standard, and we send some distractors, and we send some target. And when you have the target, you should pay attention, and that should be measurable by this big uh, impulse that you can see. And you can see here the difference on the left, that's the electrode in the concha, concha and on the right, that's with the CZ on top of the head uh, reference. What you should see is that we have the same kind of potential and same kind of uh, signal to noise ratio uh, as with the full scalp EEG, which is obviously very promising. So that was actually, that's my collaborator. And this is the kind of uh, audio EEG combined system. And here you may as well realize that it opens a huge, and this is not just us, this is obviously a huge uh, in initiative, European initiative, which is called the cognitive hearing aid. And the idea is that if the hearing aid was able to understand what you are paying attention to, that could dramatically change the world and the life of, uh, hear of people with a hearing aid, wearing hearing aids. And the idea is that merging the EEG and the audio signal together, you can actually extract that information and have the ability to do some source separation, source locking, and actually only feed that person that is speaking on a table rather than the one that is on the, on the far right, and, and so on and so forth. So when you'll be at the opening ceremony tonight, uh, there will be a lot of cocktail noise. And you can just imagine what will be the issue of somebody that has a hearing aid that just amplifies all the voices together without any discrimination. And hopefully, and that's, the, and that's the, the wheel of this project, which lasts for 10 years, we'd like to close the auditory loop and have ability to measure from those electrodes what the efferent system, so the return from the central system back to the auditory pathway, uh, what exactly the subject is paying attention to. There are many, many more applications that you can think of, but those are really the ones that are uh, getting a lot of traction as we speak. So there are many researchers uh, working in the ear. And uh, we do have some fun stuff uh, to report. And one of them is some research that has been conducted at Montreal uh, by a colleague named <clears throat> Mark Schenwissner. And he used one of the first uh, platform we developed that looked really like a hearing aid. But he used that to study the brain plasticity. So you realize that we all have the same ears. This is exactly the video I've shown you. But what you realize as well is that we don't speak the same language. I think there are 42 different languages in this conference. And so all the upper uh, auditory cortex has a very, very uh, interesting um, processing. And the way the brain is mapped and is adapted to process audio signal is really something that appears to be uh, changing or that to be uh, malleable over time. So we call that brain plasticity. And that has been studied in many aspects. And here, the fun uh, report from Mark and his uh, PhD student was that they tricked subjects with what we call the interval time difference. So you may know that the way I'm able to tell that a sound is coming from my right here 
is because the noise comes first on my right ear and then 600 microseconds later to my left ear. So this is, not, this is how I know that my ear is clipping, clapping here. My hand is clapping here. My finger are snapping. And that 600 microseconds were artificially introduced in one of the uh, auditory platform. And so what happens is that if I was clicking here, the subject would have a delayed you know, time here on the left ear. So we would say, oh, this is not here. This is actually clicking from here. So that was really interesting. And that was what he proved is that, <coughs> and I will share that, but it's a little bit uh, hard to explain. But he would show that the people are able to place correctly um, if they have the open device. They, f they are fitted with the device. This is the open ear, and they are able to place any source with, a zero, with zero de uh, degree uh, error. If you place the electronic with no delay, they are still very good. And then you add the delay. And what will be the effect is that I added that artificial delay. So I'm just displacing all my sources by 25 degrees, as you can see. And that's on day one. On day two, the brain understood that something odd was happening. And you see that it corrected by minus 15 degrees. So you still have a delay, but the brain said, oh, no, no. It comes too late on this ear, but still it's coming from, from the front. So you have some adaptation that you can see here. And you can see that at the end, after seven days, the people only have, have divided by half the error they were making. So then Mark had a very a bright idea. He said, OK, but let's see. Now I remove that delay I have, and I go back with the original uh, earpiece. Are the people able to place the zero degree? And he removed the earpiece. And this is what you get here. And you would say that they would make the counter error, or they would counter uh, react for that, and they do not. So that was really puzzling for a while. And they really wondered why, how is that that the brain was able to take into account that delay and no longer use that cue. And this is exactly what the, what the, sol the uh, explanation for that is, is that this is no longer the interval time difference delay that is the cue used for the localization, but this is more of the level, the ILD, interval level difference, and those kind of things. So I, I don't know if this uh, was clear enough, but I'm not Mark Schoenwisser, but this is definitely a very interesting study. And he did a lot of studies using those earplugs uh, as well for tonotopicity. You saw that from the video. This is how the tones are placed on the auditory cortex, how it's mapped. And same results. The brain, over seven days, adjusts to the new auditory system that you do have. So this is something that was quite new, too. All right. So now two other in-ear applications that I found uh, interesting. Uh, that one came out recently. You can buy a fertility monitor, obviously for women. And that would be a wearable inside your ear. So this is, again, a little in-ear device. You can see it here on the right. And that device obviously tracks uh, temperature and gives you some indication on uh, the fertility cycle. So that one was interesting. But I think that most of you will be more interested by the second one, which deals with the problem of jet lags. And uh, you do know about those uh, seasonal uh, mood uh, um, disorders and those kind of uh, uh, treatments. So you may be aware of light therapy. You know that if you're using bright lights during those uh, dark days during the, the winter, for example, in Northern Europe, this is coming from a Northern Europe lab, uh, you can get the uh, person to feel way better with the light therapy. And you have all the melatonin and uh, um, whatever hormones are involved uh, be back uh, at their efficient level. So what's interesting is that this team was able to prove that actually the brain or inside or below the skull, there is actually some uh, uh, cells that are sensible to the light, the photoreceptors. That can be actually triggered either by transcranial light. So this is a very bright uh, source of light that you put. And the bone is obviously half transparent, so you can uh, excite those uh, cells. But here, the light was coming, obviously, through the ear canal. And this is what they tried. And that works actually very well. You have some papers you can read. And they have very specific LED that are sending light signals inside the ear canal. And with those light signals, you are able, with 12 minutes a day, to completely uh, fade out any jet lag or uh, seasonal mood disorders that you would have and so on. So this is a very surprising uh, project. And I, I've been in touch with them. And this is definitely uh, working in a convincing way. So to finish, the um, last project we had been running in our lab was really a mechanical project. And you're all in vibrations and mechanics. Um, and I mentioned earlier that the uh, ear canal is a dynamic place. If I'm moving my jaws, I have uh, this distortion that you've seen on the video a couple minutes ago. And so we decided to use that energy uh, to create, actually, to power the little devices I've shown you. So 
the first question we had was, well, how much power is there? This is mechanical power. This is force and velocity. But how much is that? So the first study was to actually have inside the ear canal an inflatable ear plug that was filled with water that was pressurized. And we looked at open jaw and closing jaw movements. And we looked at how much displacement times pressure was created. Hence, we had an idea of the mechanical power that was available. So just to give you a figure, the potential, we believe, is around two hours of the hearing aid consumption of nowadays uh, hearing aids. So this is not a lot, but it's not completely uh, negligible. What is uh, obviously negligible is really what we can really harvest, because this is only the potential. But when we are doing harvesters, so those are really what we call micro-energy harvesters, we use, for example, piezoelectric materials. So piezoelectric materials, when they are uh, distorted, they create a voltage, and that voltage can be regulated in a very simple way here, and uh, can be used to charge uh, not a battery, but a capacitor here. And indeed, it works. And we have here um, some results where the subject was opening and closing the door uh, for 15 seconds. And you can see the voltage being created, plus or minus. And below, you can see the charge of the capacitor. We are able to recharge the capacitor using that little power. So when I say little power, that's really true. It's, and that's amazing, because that was what we call a Friday night, uh, Friday evening uh, you know, experiment. But this is something that doesn't create much energy. But in terms of uh, publication and impact and buzz, everybody was really you know, excited about the idea that you could chew gum and uh, you know, power your cell phone. So that was the kind of uh, media coverage we got. And we got, actually, and that's uh, uh, Institute of Physics out of London, again, uh, from Smart Material and Structure. We got a highlight of 2014 for those uh, kind of one of the articles we published on that. So little energy, but a lot of papers. So <clears throat> now the question is really, if we are adding all those cycles that we discussed uh, for the last uh, well, 15 minutes, uh, what do we get? And that's really the question I'm asking you here. And my answer, or my dream, is obviously that we would be able, and that's uh, together with my university and my industrial partner, be able to develop some kind of good-looking uh, wearable uh, in-ear, bionic ear uh, device that would be doing everything together. But I don't know if that will really happen. But what I know is that some of you may be able to see that in two years from now, because we are out of Montreal. And if everything works well, we should have uh, our, uh, our partner, industrial partner, be a sponsor of the exhibition in, for the ICSV 26 that would be taking place in July 2019. So if they are there, you'll know that we succeeded. If they're not there, don't ask me any questions, please. All right? So I just wanted to uh, close my talk before taking maybe four minutes question by uh, welcoming or inviting all of you uh, to be in uh, two years from now in Montreal. And here, I promise you, there will be warm weather and uh, you know, a good, sun, <laughs> good sunlight. <coughs> and and really, because Montreal is a place I enjoy a lot, you see it has an accent, Montreal. And I do have an accent. I'm obviously French speaking. But it's a place which is really multilingual, French and English. It's part of uh, Quebec, which is a French speaking part of Canada. Multicultural, multilingual, warm and welcoming, easy to get from anywhere, and easy to get around with a lot of acti uh, activity and uh, attractions in the city and around. Thank you.